before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack with the brilliant historian Claude Berube and the equally brilliant guest host Beth and Alex. Welcome to History Hack. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> See that six months in the UK really did a, serve me a purpose. I I was it wasn't just all the pubs. I was convinced. Yeah. That and all the drinking, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Six months of drinking in the, in the UK could have been worse. In case you hadn't noticed, Claude Berube is back and we're very excited. And Beth is here to say me. Hey, Beth. Hi Alex, thanks for yeah. having me. I've heard a lot about Claude, so um, from you yeah, and other people, so I'm looking well, forward yeah. to this. Beth is uh, Beth was complaining was... about how hot it is in the Midlands today. She's basically walking around in as little clothing as she can get away with. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I love the I love the the heat, but there's a difference between it being hot in your back garden and being on a beach somewhere where you can get in the sea or you can get into a pool or something. It's very different. I just I need a pool. I need a swimming pool. Someone wants to hit me up with the swimming pool. <laughs> I just think Claude's really, really happy that he doesn't have to go into Washington today. Is that right? I am very happy, but it's still equally hot. It's about 95 degrees already. It's only, it's only 10 like 10 o'clock in the morning. In the morning. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a scorcher. I forget how uh, sweaty it is around there, around the Chesapeake Bay. I know. It's horrible. It's ho absolutely horrible. That's why I'm going to retire to my goat farm in Maine. I always thought that was around. like an ironic hypothetical goat farm until I found out it is actually a goat farm. Real goat. Son, son and goats are the best, I think, are the best milking goats. You have good milk and good cheese and yeah. Oh, no, I'm I confident. can play my bagpipes all day long. Nobody, <laughs> nobody will mind. They won't be offended <laughs> at what I play. They won't be offended that I actually play the the theme from Star Trek on my bagpipes or uh, other such <laughs> tunes. You know, maybe you need a, a theme, a, a theme song for History Hack that is bagpipe based. I think that's what I'm going to work on this week. <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about Boaty stuff because it is the final episode of Boaty Week today. We've got a good one because Claude used to be the director of the U.S. Navy's uh, Museum at Annapolis. And we're going to talk about all about what they've got and why you should go there because it's undersold isn't it Claude? It really is it is the United States oldest Navy Museum it was established in 1846 the year after the Naval Academy was founded it was originally uh, they called it the Naval School Lyceum and then eventually uh, had a building in 1939 but we I will say we, we probably have the I, we had or we had the best stuff because it is the oldest material, all the oldest artifacts that, because that was the only show in town. Mm. And so it was, a, it was a real honor and a pleasure to be the, the director for nine years. I just left, what was it, three months ago for my new job. And uh, truly a, a wonderful experience to just walk through not only the exhibit areas, work with the staff, uh, but also go in the stacks uh, and the other storage areas to see what really goes on behind the scenes. And that uh, really culminated my 16 years teaching at the Naval Academy. I was uh, in both the political science and the history departments. I did Tough to leave. Just, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, any regrets about leaving now? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have a bad day at the Naval Academy. I loved teaching midshipmen. I loved working with our future Navy and Marine Corps officers. I always learned something from them every day, especially the international students. We have uh, probably 20 or 30 countries represented, and I, uh, in the past couple of years, taught specifically just the international students, and it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, they were fantastic, engaged, and I learned a lot about different regions of the world, from Romania to Sri Lanka, and it was just a great opportunity. So yeah, I, in a, in a way, I regret leaving, but I really felt that I had to at this point to uh, pursue something that was, uh, I was approached to do some work, and because sometimes it's tough when you're asked to do something, you can't say no. 
but speaking of pursuing, Beth's going to be after you because she does the museum focus in the Great War Group magazine and she's like, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to get you to write me 400 words to advertise a museum. But... <laughs> Good. Well, you know, what you can do, Beth, is talk to your buddy, Kate Jameson, because I'm pretty sure uh, when she came through a couple of years ago, she... all of our all of our Nelson material, our Nelson, Nelson statue, our Nelson letters somehow disappeared. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I don't, I don't really, know if there's a time. That's really there. odd. That is, that it would she, be, hasn't she okay. just bought a new house? I'm starting. Hmm. Mm, mm. Mm, mm, um, you know, <laughs> is the Naval Academy Museum just about the academy? No, it isn't. Uh, now there are about 11 museums in the Navy system here in the United States. There is one focused on just sailors, one on just submarines, one on uh, uh, the the um, uh, aviation down in Pensacola. But the reason why we, we really cover more than the Naval Academy is, be is because what I mentioned earlier, we're the oldest museum. So early on, they had to find a place for all of these artifacts that had been from the American Revolution, War of 1812. And so when the Naval Academy Museum is found in 1845, it found a natural home. For example, uh, probably the one of the best known collections at the museum are the uh, captured trophy flags. And in 1849, President James Knox Polk designated the United States Naval Academy Museum as the official home for or repository for all flags captured by naval forces in combat. So that's why we have, for example, the Royal Standard. And a lot of people in the United States don't understand the, the, the importance of a Royal Standard. It is when you go to Buckingham Palace, you'll see the if the Queen's in residence, the, the flag will fly above uh, Buckingham Palace. I saw that a, a few years ago when I was in London. And this one was captured at the Battle of York. Today it's Toronto, Canada. And we had displayed that for some time. Uh, but all of the flags from the War of 1812, the, battle, the HMS Macedonian, Levant, uh, you can go down the list. That is why they have a home in the United States Naval Academy Museum. And actually, if, if uh, you go to YouTube, you can see the, the Royal Standard laid out over about 42 long tables when we had a special event with the Assistant uh, Naval Attaché from the Royal Navy and the Canadian Naval Attaché. So just type in British Royal Standard and, and Naval Academy Museum and you should be able to see the event that we had for that. So that's really why we, we cover more than just the history of the Naval Academy but it's so integrated because the Naval Academy uh, produced so many of the officers between 1846 when the first class came out to I'd say the end of the, close to the end of, of, of the Second World War, the majority of the officers were from the Academy. So that's why it's significant in US history. So it's a very symbiotic relationship, sometimes syphilitically. There's a story that one of our there's some records we, we maintain a lot of records at the Naval Academy of, of uh, midshipmen and back at the turn of the century I would go in through the stacks and come across these medical records of midshipmen contracting syphilis and gonorrhea on their midshipmen crews and there was actually one midshipmen record that we're not allowed to display because the individual became a very significant admiral in the United States Navy during the Second World War, but we're not allowed to let our current midshipmen know that that there were such things going on among sailors. <laughs> I love it, as if no one, <laughs> as if no one knows what sailors get up to. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you go on History Hack, you go from, you know, serious Straight historian <laughs> Obviously, as you've just mentioned, that the Academy Museum has more to do with than just the history of the Academy itself. But it quite interestingly, it has quite a few models of, of British dockyard models. What why why are there so many at the at the museum? Uh, that is probably the jewel in the crown of the Naval Academy Museum. We have a 40,000 square foot facility and two decks of galleries. The top deck is entirely British dockyard models. Uh, now these models were made uh, in the six Royal Navy shipyards and usually given as a gift by the King or the Queen to, to someone. And they were built at the same time as the ships themselves. Sometimes it would take a lot longer. A ship, uh, a frigate or 
a ship of the line was a bit like a Lincoln Logs or, or Legos. You could assemble everything in, on the dockyards and then in a few months time you would have a ship. Whereas the craftsmanship required for one of these dockyard models might take two years to build the same kind of ship. And so in uh, the First World War, there was a very wealthy gentleman, Henry Huddleston Rogers. He was the son of one of the wealthiest men in America. And Rogers was a colonel, went to England and then he stayed around and he started traveling around and went to all these estates and found all these models on the mantles in, in the estates. And he started purchasing them. He bought about 50 of them. And when he passed away in 1935, 36, he bequeathed them to the United States Naval, Navy with the understanding that it would build a proper museum mm -hmm. and that it would hire a curator. So we have had only four curators, ship model curators since 1939. And their full-time job is to uh, really preserve and repair, maintain and show these British dockyard models. The oldest one we have, I think is the oldest known one in the world at about 350 years, but we have them representing nearly every decade of the Royal Navy up until about, I think the, I think our most recent one will probably be the ship of the line Trafalgar, which would what have been uh, 18, 1830s, early 1840s. Mm. And they, you know, when people come, they say, well, why ex exactly do you have these? And we'll tell them the story about Rogers, but also the fact that for most of that time, the United States were colonies under the British empire. So it really is part of our history. And so much of the architecture, the ship architecture that go, went into, whether it was the, the coppering of HMS Minerva, which is probably my favorite model up there. The, uh, it, it's really a story about the United States Navy as well, because we learned or we tried to counteract something that the Royal Navy had. And it's, it's a great opportunity when, when I was teaching, I had, my classroom was just off the dockyard model collection. And so when I wanted to talk about the War of 1812, I could show them a large a model of a three foot model of the Constitution right next to HMS Guerriere and show them the differences and why was it that the Constitution was able to defeat so many ships because it overpowered it. We would talk about what a first rate ship of the line was versus a fifth rate frigate. Uh, so it, it's a great teaching opportunity as well. But that's why we have those models. The, the other uh, we have Britannia, we have Sussex, and we're able to tell the story of the Sussex going down with the gold and how we were approached about, uh, I guess, uh, 15 or 20 years ago by some explorers who had apparently found the, the Sussex. And they asked us for the model. They were going to purchase the model outright, but we were a federal museum. We're not allowed to sell those things. And they wanted to do that so they could prove that they had found the Sussex because there are no plans for it. We also have the St. George. Uh, which is one of the very few ships that has its original rigging. And so I think there have been two books written on the St. George. And we have people coming in from Europe just to see that particular model. Mm, that's insane. It's not the only model you've got either. It's, this one's brilliant. So you also have a collection of models made from bone. Do you want to tell people why mm -hmm. and how they came about? Yeah, those are from uh, the midshipmen who didn't really make it through their four years and uh, they just fell by the wayside. And, yeah, <laughs> and that's what you use the uh, bone for. <laughs> well, the uh, French POW bone model collection is, is, I think, the second crown in the jewel, or jewel in the crown, excuse me. I haven't had my coffee yet or my scotch, so it's been a really rough morning. Uh, the French POW bone model collection, we've got about 30 models. And what would happen is during the Napoleonic Wars, the French lost most of their naval battles. And as a consequence, there were tens of thousands of prisoners who were at the different uh, prisons around the UK. Well, they had a lot of time on their hands and they would take the bone from you know, their lunch or their dinner. They would get glue from rabbits running around the yard. They would take thread from the uniforms. They would melt down brass buttons and they would build these really extraordinary bone models of ships. The, they weren't precise because you know most of these these French prisoners were you know probably one of the lower gun decks they had no idea what the enemy ship looked like uh, but it really was just supposed to be a decorative piece probably the most the, the 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 most famous one we have is it's about two and a half feet long and it is of HMS Victory and in addition to all the other materials I just mentioned it also has along the gun decks um, baleen from Wales. Now in the, 
uh, 17, 1800s, women would have these corsets and you would put baleen in the pockets these, and, and you would bring in your waist. Now, as, as a Navy officer, I've actually tried to do that when they, weigh, when they weigh and measure me every six months. And I keep trying to tell them, this is, this is Navy tradition, you know, this is Navy history, but the chiefs never don't have any appreciation for the whole thing. So uh, this, mo this particular model took 15 prisoners of war two years to the day to make. Again, it's not a precise model of victory, but it was on Nelson's tomb at St. Paul's for some time. In the early, just prior to World War I in the run-up, I wanna say about 13 or, 1913 or 14, as England was selling off some items in order to raise money for the fleet, this was one of the items. It was very controversial. And apparently Churchill went on to give a speech on the House, on the House of Lords suggesting, you know, my, my fellow Lords, if you are so, you know, upset about this, perhaps you'll purchase it. Well, they didn't. An American bought it. His name was E.F. Hutton. Now, when I was a kid, there was a commercial on television called, uh, and it said, uh, when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. E.F. Hutton was uh, an early uh, financier, and he was able to purchase this. And we've had that on display now for, I, geez, 60, 70 years at least. And Lady Thatcher came in uh, to visit the museum and uh, was was quite taken by it. Didn't oh, take wow. it, but was quite taken. Yeah, unusual. So, and, and, but there are other people items. People just yeah. usually steal all the artifacts we want and take them back to Britain. <laughs> so, mm. ask the Egyptians. Uh, but I will say that there are they, they, these were incredible craftsmen uh, among the French. They uh, the two that I purchased through auction. One was a working spinning jenny, and another one was a working guillotine. And when we displayed the guillotine, I actually wanted the head to be popping off in mid, you know, stroke. <laughs> uh, but we had a lot of children coming in or had a lot of children coming into the museum and we might offend somebody so I decided ah maybe we won't do that the only other thing I could say is uh, if you've been up to Orkney to the Italian chapel I would say it's comparable to that because it's amazing the material that they used in order to make something so beautiful yeah what what do you obviously what you've just mentioned the the bone models and the, and the dockyard models are obviously as you said really important parts of what is at the museum but what do you think are the most important particular pieces in the in the wider collection probably the most important piece we have is the d guts flag the don't give up the ship flag now during the war of 1812 the uss uh, Chesapeake, a very unlucky ship, took on HMS Shannon, and the captain of the Chesapeake, James Lawrence, was shot, and he was dying on his ship, and he told his crew, don't give up the ship. Well, in reality, they did give up the ship. They, they surrendered the ship. But his friend, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, heard about those dying words, and he mounted them on a large flag and flew it above his flagship, the Niagara, in the Battle of Lake Erie, where he was victorious, his best-known battle. So I think that's probably the most important item we have, and it's replicated so, so many times. Uh, another item is the World War II surrender display. Now aboard, this is for the Pacific War, mm -hmm. and aboard the USS Missouri, uh, the Americans and the Allies and the Japanese are aboard the ship. We've got the surrender table, the surrender cloth. We've got Admiral Nimitz's uniform that he was wearing that day. We have one of Prince the two Philip pens. Was there, wasn't he? What, was he aboard uh, Missouri? He I'm may, not, he may he have been. He was aboard the American ship and watched the surrender. So I'm not sure. He may have been. Yeah. Uh, so we've got the two surrender pen, one of the two surrender pens. The, we've got a copy of the surrender treaty, but when Nimitz came into the museum in 1960, he took the pen and signed his name. Now, the, there's two funny stories to that because Jack McCain was one of my students. Jack is the son of uh, former Senator, former presidential candidate, John McCain, long history of, of uh, naval service in that family. And his great grandfather was, was right there. And he said, well, that is actually isn't the original table. The original table was a nice, uh, I don't know, oak or mahogany table. And there was a nice, nice leather chair, but the surrender treaties together were too large to have both Nimitz and uh, the Japanese minister. So they got rid of it as the Japanese are coming aboard. They went down to the crew decks and they got one of the folding tables from breakfast as, as they were finishing up. They're running up with the table. They stop off at the wardroom. They grab the first coffee stained uh, cloth that they could get and they put that on. Now the trouble was, Jack told me, 
was that one of the, the Japanese minister apparently had a wooden leg. And when he went to sit down, he swung, he swung his leg around and it hit the hinge on the table. So everybody who was there saw the table start to waver. And here's, and I always thought, this is like probably one of the most significant, memorable Photoshop moments in uh, World War II history. And it could have gone horribly wrong. The other part of that is that there's a photo of the, sur the actual surrender. And you see MacArthur on the left-hand side. And when I arrived at the museum, I guess nine and a half years ago, MacArthur was not in the, the big image on the backside. And I asked my predecessor, Scott Harmon, I said, Scott, why, why isn't MacArthur displayed here? I mean, he was right there. And Scott was a member of the class of 1964 from the academy. He said, because MacArthur was a real son of a bitch and I'll be damned if I have him in my museum. So uh, <laughs> I, I do have a West Point grad and a 10th Mountain Division uh, a veteran in my in my on my staff, or I did until I was there, and they they replaced MacArthur. So I think th those are two. Uh, the John Paul Jones presentation sword that he re received from King Louis the Sixteenth of France. We have pieces of the Exocet missile that hit the USS Stark in the Gulf in the nineteen eighties. Wow! Uh, I think those are those are all pretty significant. Um, and but we have a lot of books. We have early. 17th century signal and flag books, which are absolutely beautiful. So. Mm -hmm. That's mad. Um, if so, away from important historically, if when you mm -hmm. left they'd said, Claude, with no guilt attached whatsoever, you can take one thing with you, what would it have been? Originally, I would have said the death mask of Commodore Charles Stewart because I wrote my first biography. Oh, uh, 15, you love it. You did an episode ago. on him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah I did. did. Uh, but when he died in 1869, there was a death mask. I would have loved that. But the real one, and I wish I would have taken it, was a cigar from your grandfather, Alex. Oh, no uh, way. Come yeah, on. really. And oh, it's real history. <laughs> Complete with spittle. Uh, but apparently he was on the USS Augusta with FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, for a meeting. And we have a menu from, from that evening signed by all the participants, all the admirals from both the Royal Navy and the American Navy. But there is that unused Winston Churchill cigar. And I swore to myself, I would take that and smoke the bejesus out of it the day I left. <laughs> and I so regret not having taken that. I, I really, really wanted that one. Have I, have I exploded Twitter again, Alex, for suggesting that you're related to Winston? Uh, yeah, Did probably at some okay. point, yeah, some, some nut is going to come along and, uh, <laughs> and decide to have another go at me for it. I'm going to say, you've already had plenty of people have a go at you. <laughs> it's the only reason I call him Grandad now, because it winds balloons up. Yeah. I, so, do, I wonder about people listening to yesterday's episode, where I don't think Phil Weir referred to Churchill by name once. He just referred to him as Grandad for the whole interview. What on earth is this? Um, so how much of the collection is actually displayed, Claude, and, and, and how much is it, you know, tucked away safely somewhere? And, and then who gets to decide what is actually shown and what isn't? So when I was director, we had 60,000 items in the collection, about 1500 are on permanent display. And we've got two storage areas. And Only 1500? On mm -hmm. Wow. Outstanding. Really, well, when sad. you figure that, you know, between paintings and some of the, lar the larger artifacts, it's really tough. And you've got mm. two floors of about 20,000 square feet. You know, you don't want to overpopulate them. So uh, what we would do with some of the other items is we have three special galleries and every year or so we would have a special display. One year it was on the 40th anniversary of women being admitted to the Naval Academy, that was 2016. We did one on the centenary of World War I. We are doing one right, or they are doing one right now on the, history, the 175 years of the Naval Academy and the, that anniversary. So I would really look for special topics. Uh, one of my favorite uh, was a, an exhibit on Philo McGiffin, class of 1882, who was a real screw up. Uh, when he was a, a midshipman, I went into his midshipman record. Now he was not one of the syphilitic midshipmen yeah. of the 1800s, <laughs> uh, but he had more demerits than almost anybody else. He would go into the, he, he would get more demerits and he would be sent to this sort of prison barge that they had at the academy at the time, the, the old frigate Santee. But I thought he was a really interesting character and he was known as, as this, this 
this person for a century, but there was so much more to him. When I went into his record, I found that Albert Michelson, who ended up getting the Nobel Prize for Physics for calculating the speed of light at the Academy, was using these mirrors, and we have those mirrors. Well, if I'm going into the records, and I see demerits by Ensign Michelson, and it goes on to say, you know, for interfering with experiments. So basically, what Philo McKiffin was doing is he had his own set of mirrors, and he was basically fucking with Mid Michelson's experiments on the speed of light. So it was just one thing after another. So he, he couldn't get a commission because there weren't that many ships after the Civil War, and he graduated low because of his demerits. So he goes off to China and joins the Chinese Navy. He ends up becoming the, the superintendent of their Naval Academy, ends up commanding a ship at the Battle of Yalu, is, is wounded. I mean, it's just an incredible story. So I think you look, uh, Beth, I think you really try to look for stories like that within the collection, whether it's about an individual, an organization, or an anniversary. What do you do with stuff? I'm guessing somewhere in those 60,000 or things that you had access to when you were in charge. Mm -hmm. What do you do? There's a big thing at the moment with Confederate stuff, with the yucky stuff. How do you approach that? The idea that some of this stuff now, I mean, is there anything in the museum collection that you couldn't display mm -hmm. now because it's just inappropriate? So we were very involved because we have two buildings that at least were until recently known for being named after Confederate naval officers, uh, Maury and Matthew Maury and Buchanan, Franklin Buchanan, who was the commander. He was basically the Robert Lee of Robert e. Lee of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, the only, we do have a lot of Confederate items. The only restriction we had that came from the Department of Defense was that uh, we could not, uh, DOD facilities could not display Confederate flags. Okay. Now that becomes a problem with a museum because heck, we had Confederate flags. We had, but so, we had to actually distinguish that we had printed flags to show uh, this item came from this particular Navy. And we justified it says, look, we have the same thing for the Japanese or the Nazis during World War II. Yeah. It is historical interpretation. It is not glorifying. And we always tell the stories. Uh, we don't hide history. We have Benedict Arnold. We have an entire display on Benedict Arnold uh, during the American Revolution. The Russian commander in chief, their Navy once asked me, you know, why would you show such a traitor? And I said, well, before he was a traitor or a hero to you folks, he was, uh, uh, he was the hero of Valcor Island. And he was quite an effective uh, 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 leader in the American Revolution. So we don't hide from history. And I think that's the way, the best way to approach it. Doesn't mean you have to have statues of, of, of uh, the losing side all over the place. And we don't. Historians say no to cancel culture all part of the education it's part of the education and a hundred years from now there will be something today that is deemed offensive and i i i don't say that lightly i i don't particularly care for for displaying confederate statues somewhere but you can put them elsewhere like near a museum with proper interpretation saying this is why this is who this person was this is why the statue was made at the time it was in american history but we're, you know, we're all historians. We're now. Exactly. This is what we do. We interpret history. We try to explain history to people. And I don't think uh, historians ought to hide history. No, I think that's what's happened with the guy that ended up in the river in Bristol, isn't it? He's now in a museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. People, yeah, yeah. With the graffiti on it, with an interpretation telling you why he ended up face down. in a Which is how it should be done. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Obviously, the museum is in Annapolis, and I always want to say Maryland because that's very, but it's Mary, Maryland. I'll try, Maryland, <laughs> I'll try yeah. Maryland. Um, obviously, not everyone can get there. I mean, the more and more I hear about the east coast of the United States, the more I actually really do want to go. Um, but how are there any artifacts from the museum on loan elsewhere, or can you look at things online? Do you have like online exhibits? How does it work in that respect? Sure, we do loan items out. In fact, the John Paul Jones sword was in the uh, Versailles for some time, and then it went to the Met here in the United States. The uh, flag, the Sujaji flag, which was the commander's flag in, in uh, Korea in 1871, we had that, but it is now displayed in South Korea. Mm -hmm. I would say we're, we're trying, or at least when I was leaving, we were trying to adhere more to the Smithsonian Institution standards of just having two to three year loans, and you don't continue them. What we have found is that if somebody has an item for 20, 30 years, 
in, and we renewed the loans, they tend to think that they own them now. Mm. Uh, that, that's happened several times in the past year, and it, it becomes a, a very politically charged issue. But There's for anybody a couple who, of uh, canon from HMS Victory where they don't even actually know where they are now. Yeah. I know they got loaned uh, out, but no one knows where they uh, are. It's been so long. Well, it's, yeah, that's the thing is back then they didn't keep very good records, mm. or at least not a, they, they didn't have the accession records that we do uh, maintain today. Uh, but if you go online, if you go to YouTube and type in the Naval Academy Museum, you'll see the history of, a, of the Navy and 100 objects from the Naval Academy Museum. And that was inspired by the BBC series, A History of the World and 100 Objects. And I did that with a couple of midshipmen. I let them produce it. I said, here are the items that I think we should just, that should be on the video. So you'll see me display or discussing some of them. You'll see uh, my predecessor or our ship model curator talking about some of the, the artifacts that are there. Uh, on Facebook and Twitter, you'll see a lot of videos and photos of, of items. And I think those, those are the big places that you can uh, see what we have at the museum. Of course, the website, if you go to usna.edu backslash museum, you'll see some of our current and previous exhibits and, and some other items as well. Uh, but we did, I, one of the interesting loans that I did, this was uh, January of 2018, I got a call from Camp David, which is the uh, res uh, resort, the vacation home, whatever, for the presidents of the United States. And it's actually a ca Navy captain who commands that base. And the reason why is because during the 1930s, Roosevelt didn't want to use his presidential yacht. So he sent all of his sailors up to camp, what was what became known as Camp David. And uh, he said, hey, do you, do you have anything for Camp David? So I popped up there one day and uh, this Trump was in office. So I said, well, you know, I know uh, how about we'll get a couple of these models. We'll get Stephen Decatur's sword uh, and a couple of paintings. And I knew he, the president liked Andrew Jackson. So I, I got the Andrew Jackson portrait, one of the originals that Asher Durand had made. And so uh, interestingly enough, the first lady didn't like the Andrew Jackson portrait. Mm -hmm. So if you, so the Trump really liked it. So what he did is he replaced the one in the White House that he had for about a year with this one. And if, so if you look at old pictures, you'll see two different Andrew Jacksons behind Trump. Mm. And the day after the election, the first one of the first things I did was uh, direct my registrar to have that returned. <laughs> so. That's why I was going to back. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we don't like the new thing. <laughs> no, I think I think that's pretty fair. Yeah, and it's and it's important. I, I think the loan process, you get to work with other museums and visiting other museums is important. I was in Portsmouth a few years ago and had a great meeting with Nick Hewitt over there. And also uh, Phil Ware and Kate Jamison gave me a tour. And it's so important to learn how other museums do things better so that you can improve as well. And we often find that we, that we have some of the same challenges and we try to find the answers together. Need to ask you because this is history hack and because i kind of know mm -hmm. the answer because i've seen something deeply smutty that you sent me um I've, before anybody starts like i sent you art i did not say him for being like a, a pervert he wasn't it's a piece of art but nonetheless it's that smutty that you're not allowed to display it what tawdry stuff do you have in the vault history hack listeners want to know so as i was going through the storage areas you know i went through the artwork and we have thousands of pieces of art and I found this watercolor and it was titled, what was it? Uh, John Paul Jones in close action with Madame de Chaumont. And it's of a, a, a beautiful bedroom. And, you know, John, John Paul Jones is on top of this woman and the legs are all flying and his, his uh, hat is off to the side, his sword is off to the side, his boots are, are off to the side. And I said, I, I was like, okay, this is not how we've ever seen John Paul Jones displayed before. Well, John Paul Jones, when he was in Paris, was a bit randy, and he did have apparently an affair with Madame de Chaumont, whose husband was one of the financiers of the American Revolution. In fact, he was the governor of uh, the Hotel des Invalides, which is uh, has another tie to John Paul Jones, because Ernest Flagg was an architect in the United States at the turn of the century. And he was a part of the Beaux-Arts School. He went to Paris to study. And he took Hotel des Invalides and he used that as the role model for the Naval Academy Chapel. And below the Naval Academy Chapel is John Paul Jones's tomb. So there, there is this continuing tie. So this piece was done by Bill, Gil excuse me, Bill Gilkerson, 
who was a maritime writer and artist. And I asked our, our historian who had been there for 50 years, I said, Jim, I don't understand what exactly is this. And he says, well, we were all having drinks one night about 30 years ago and we were joking about John Paul Jones. And so Bill decided to do this, but uh, we are, we're all under orders that we can never release this, this image. We can never let it be displayed. So yeah, that's the, that's the I think the most, the most uh, sensitive item that was in the collection, aside from the syphilitic records, but. Well, yeah. I'm so gonna ask you about that when we start recording. <laughs> who, who among us, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, just to round off, uh, not that you didn't contribute some of these questions yourself. You went to school with McDreamy. You went to school with Patrick Dempsey, is that right? Yeah, Pat, Pat, I'll tell you, Pat was a great kid. He came over. We were both born in the same hometown. He was born a couple of months uh, before me, which is why I look so much younger than him. Yeah. I was going to say as so well, correct. I mean, is he jealous yeah. of your rakish GQ handsomeness? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, this is a guy who's on the cover of People and has millions of dollars. I don't think he's, uh, he's jealous of me in any way, shape, or form. No, Pat uh, came to our high school to perform. He, he was an incredible performer. I saw him dance with a chair at a high school dance like it was like one of these 1930s movies where he was it was a folding chair uh but i'd see watch him juggle and i saw him perform at a shakespearean theater company and just really I, he's done so much good for our hometown yeah. and establishing a, a cancer center and he's he was just a great guy then and he he's just demonstrated i think that that he continues to be that person for my hometown yeah we were he, he was a great kid he was a lot of fun you say dancing with a chair. The, uh, I've danced with a chair many times, but as a girl, I'm only ever required to hump it as part of the cell block tango, unfortunately. <laughs> so there's nothing skillful about it. It's just, here's a pair of hot yeah, tap and a corset, have at it. And can you speak yeah. Hungarian? Because no one ever can speak Hungarian to do that bit. Wait a minute, I thought she was Polish. Is that, that's the uh, musical Chicago, right? Yeah, it is. No, in, in fact, we had a Turkish girl and she just did it in Turkish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No one was going to go and learn Hungarian for that. No one cared enough. Claude, thank you so much. Oh, it is clear you evidently still have so much love for this museum. Oh, you're like, uh, for the football reps, you're like Joe Cole on uh, BT Sports, still with We This, We That, whenever Chelsea are playing. It's like unable to divorce himself from a very long history with a very fine institution. Uh, and anyone that can get to Annapolis to go to the museum, get there. Alex, it's a, really a pleasure. And thanks for what you guys provide every day. I listen to the pods uh, almost every day. And thanks. It's a, it, it's a lot of fun and I learn a lot. So thank you for what you do. Oh, you're welcome. No. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great 